Hi everybody, it's Zane with Sailing Views and today I have a very special guest. Uh, not only is he the co-founder of Quantum Sales, but he's also my boss. So uh, with that, I'd like to introduce Far uh, Farley Fontenot. So how you doing, Farley? Great, Zane. Uh, I never think of you ever having a boss at all. I think it's you being your own boss, but no, <laughs> thanks for having me. I think, um, not only thanks for having me, but it's amazing to me how this format has done so well during the time, during this pandemic as I call it, the pandemic, the yeah. pandemic time. But it's it's a great format. And again, thanks for having me. Yeah. Oh, I'm happy to have you. Uh, yeah, like you said, this, uh, you know, with everything going on right now, it it's definitely changed everything. And, you know, I think a lot of people are working from home and this is kind of becoming, you know, I hate to say the new normal, but this is how a lot of people are communicating. So it, you know, uh, you know, the platform, we'll see if it works. We'll see if it holds up. Um, all right. So with all of that, Let's go ahead and get started into uh, these 20 sailing questions. Um, right. So how did you get started? And, you know, tell us a little bit about that. Well, I was, I, I come from a very unique background in that my grandfather and my father both raced. And so I was the oldest of five children. And so at five years old, while they were teaching at the yacht club, they pulled me out in an Opti or actually a Sabbat. Huh. And we started, I just sailed, sailed, turned over. They'd come get me or dripped up in the land. But I sailed forever, you know, starting at five, just sailing around. And then when our yacht club got six opties, we started racing. And I kind of took into it. I liked it. It was fun. And about that time, my father and grandfather started racing a lightning and the three of us for probably five years raced lightnings or flying scots, which come to find, you know, hindsight, it was probably the best sailing and most fun sailing. It's very seldom you ever get to actually one design race with your father and your grandfather. Yeah. My father drove and my grandfather was in the middle and I was on the bow. Um, and then later on, you know, I, at one point I got a paper route, saved all my money and bought it. I never forget, I bought a, a sunfish and a Big old truck came to my house and dropped off a box and opened it up and there was my sunfish. <laughs> so I am one of the lucky guys in our sport that I've been doing it so long, it's second nature. Yeah. You know, I never had, we, I didn't have a coach. I never had anybody, you know, going out and, hey, blow it with the whistle, tack, tack, tack. We just went out and played. So that's how I started. Yep. You know, I, I was similar uh, just in growing up. I've grown up sailing with and against my dad pretty much all my life. Um, he's actually the reason I kind of drove myself to become a decent sailor was, you know, we're playing around on Wednesday nights in the Sunfish and, uh, you know, we're racing around the harbor, you know, from one channel mark to the other and stuff like that. And my dad was always cleaning everybody's clock. And like I say, at eight or nine years old, of course, I want to be better than dad. So. You know, I just pushed myself and pushed myself until I could finally be there with them. So, all right. So, I think there, I think you would find in a lot of great racers that, and, and it's it's a it's also part of our sport. Our sport yeah. is it's it's hereditary. It gets passed down from generation to generation. I mean, we do get some new people in, which is always great. But if you look, talk to a lot of great racers, it started at home with their parents or their grandparents. Yep. Yep. You're absolutely right. All right. So who had some uh, other other than your dad and grandfather, which sounds like they had a big influence on you. Uh, who else helped shape your sailing and, you know, your sailing career and get you really going? You know, I mean, there were a lot of people in my life, but I was really fortunate. Uh, after after college, I came to Houston and through a friend of mine, Chip Evil, I reconnected with Coleus, John Coleus. And so we talked and he said hey come work for me at at that time he had just started he just came back from the olympics from winning the silver medal i think in kingston and he said you know let's come work we do some sailing together be fine i went yeah at the time i wasn't i wasn't sold with the person i was with the company so i came over here um and john and i kind of bonded to a i don't know that was 50, 45 year relationship and we won at the end you know i don't know we won two j24 world championships we won 
couple of SORCs. We did then went and did the 50 footers together. Uh, we did trans. I mean, we we put a lot of miles in together around the world. Yeah. Uh, match racing. But I was really fortunate because I also, other than John, then John introduced me to the DeVos family mm. uh, out of Michigan. And I joined them in 85, where we had built, we, Mr. DeVos had built a 50 footer, one of the last boats. Well, one of the last slots right there before that America's Cup, he built a 50 footer at William Manchester in Newport to do the 86 SRC. And I, it's like December 22nd. I, I never had met these guys. Mr. DeVos at that time was the uh, head of the New York Yacht Club Syndicate America too. And Coleus and Bertrand, John Bertrand, had been over there and they were been working with them. And so I get a call from John and said, hey, this is gonna be a new project for you. I need you to get over there, you know, so go to Newport. And so I went to Newport that morning we we shoveled snow off that boat and here come the the boss boys you know dick <laughs> and doug their friends we introduced ourselves we went sailing boat worked um we had ron love who was with us from from force bar at that point and dave also sailed a little bit with us and um we took that boat apart and took it to the 86 src and the only the reason i bring it up is that the DeVos family afforded me so much opportunity through my whole life of traveling and sailing. Um, you know, we did, we did that 50 footer and then we did another 50 footer and then we did another 50 footer. Then we did a 70 footer. If we did a J 44 and one D 35 and one D 48 and yeah. PB 52s and the 86. I mean, we have sailed. I am now on when we started out, I started out, with Mr. DeVos, yeah. who was my you know, age, and now we're sailing with their sons, yeah. and we're coaching their sons. I did a, we coached I coached them on the Meldrus 32s. Ryan won the Worlds one year, and then we came up and we did a, we did that 86. We did I did 27 Mackinac races with them, yeah. and then. So, and during that process, you know, I had people like John Bertrand, uh, Spithill, Ed Baird. Yeah. Um, Every who's who. Jonathan who's McKee. Who. Yeah. You know, I mean, we went through all of those guys who all bring, Terry, T. Hutch, yeah. who all bring such a unique look or view into the sport that you take, I was fortunate enough to have to been with them, coached them, or sailed with them to take what I thought was the best of each one of them and yeah. take it on to the next project. So I, I have been so fortunate in my career of not only being in a lot of great races, but, but to have been with, with people that, with, with the heroes of the sports or better up the legends of the sport yeah. and have been able to take away from them in every project that we've done. Yeah. Well, that that's uh, definitely an amazing who's who of uh, sailing that you just named off that you got to sail with. I, I, I never think about it till we just it gives me goosebumps in a way. But yeah. I never think about it until we talk about it right now, and you go, "Holy shit, that was a run!" You know? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's been a good run. Yeah. You know, speaking of the old SORC days, uh, do you remember heavy metal? Oh uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I remember it. It came from your part of the world. I'm sure you were probably on that thing. Oh yeah, I I I, I got to play around with it on a kid. They didn't really take me racing. I was I was a little too small. But uh, yeah, y'all called it the Iron Pig or something. I don't know. It, uh, you know that that designer Lee Creekmore. He's still a member of my yacht club, and he and I, yeah, we we sit down and talk for so many hours about you know different designs and just weird things that. You do with you know, he was so. a great he was a great Marcy designer. Yeah. yeah. And Marcy was strong. Yeah. Those Creek Moors were, were always up there and the leading probably he's one of the best boats up there. Yeah. The um you know, we too, that first that first uh Frere's fifty with the DeVosses was a metal boat. Yeah. Completely alone with the most beautiful hydraulic pipe work through the boat. When I walked in, I went, Oh my god, this thing was beautiful. It was also the heaviest boat that we may have ever raced, including the 86. I, I'm, I'm exaggerating, but I'm not. 
It's a weight and, smasher. <laughs> and that thing, man, it it was beautiful. Yeah. And it's still sailing. A, a guy wrote me the other day and said, he asked me questions about it, how to tune it. Like, I, you know, like, oh, yeah, I've got my notes from 1985. But he... Um, <laughs> He he's it's sailing in in uh, in England right now. Wow! So um, it's funny. There was a lot of heavy metals in those days. Oh yeah, just yours was named heavy metal. Ours was named heavy metal. Yeah, and the story with the one we had is, uh, you know, they started building it, ran out of that material, had to upsize, ran out of that material, had to upsize. So the poor boat was just kind of doomed from the start. Um, you know, yeah. it, and no offense, Mr. Creekmore, but I'm telling you. That was one of the ugliest boats I'd ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that boat just resurfaced. It would have been fast, it would have been great, but man, that was an ugly boat, you yeah. know? Well, I don't know. I still love the stern. Um, and that boat just resurfaced over at a boat yard in New Orleans. Uh, somebody oh, got really? it. They put a, a, a cruising style deck on it. And, you know, and I, I'm sitting there and I was looking at this uh, America's Cup boat that has shown up. And, I look over and I'm like, wait a minute, I recognize that stern. Walk around, you know, it's dark blue, it's a cool cruiser, it's still got that big centerboard, which is just hideous looking. But uh yeah, I, it still lives. So You know, that that SORC was a very in a time where we had a lot of very unique series. Yeah. You know, the SORC was six weeks of racing. Yeah. And we were gone almost the whole six weeks. Uh you know, we would we'd get the boats to St. Pete and we'd do some day race to St. Pete. We'd race to Lauderdale. We'd race to from Lauderdale. We did a triangle. Then we raced to Nassau. And then and then we had two or three days in Nassau with time in between because we were working on the boats. And I mean, it was the Admiral's Cup, the Kenwood Cup. There was all of these series around the world that a was the best racing ever. It was all, all IOR racing. But more importantly, I mean, the, some of the best sailors, but they were long, grueling events mm -hmm. that, you know, thank God we were young, and, but it was hard racing. And we don't have those that type of series anymore. That, but those were very unique times with very unique rating rules. Yeah. And those series fit right in where, you know, it was nothing like, hey, tomorrow we're going to start a 350, 400 mile race. We'll see you guys in a couple of days, five, six days, and off we go. Yeah, that's what I was just about to ask. What could we do to get a series like that going again, or is it even possible nowadays? Well, that, that's a very good question because it's a question our industry and our sport ask all the time. Mm -hmm. We were very fortunate at that time to have only one rating rule, mm -hmm. which you can argue whether the rating rule made beautiful boats or slow boats or fast boats or whatever, but we had one rule. You take that boat and you take a boat that you were racing in – Annapolis and you put it on a ship and you go to Genoa for a big regatta in Italy, all the boats were still rated the same. The rule was the same. Yeah. So it was very easy to switch around and to guys say switch around to go from event to event and bring boats and they everybody knew the rule. Everybody knew the rules in the game. Right. Now rules, you know, this is a little Farley font of soapbox, but there's all of these different rules there's there's orc and irc and orr and, and they're all good rules they are right. all really good rules yeah but they're competing against each other so it is basically nobody i can't go to a client and he says hey i want to build a 40-foot boat we go great here's the rule of the day because we got to decide which rule it is and then how many boats are racing that rule and where is it raced and it's so segmented that the sport is that the the racing scene at that level racing is all segmented yeah. and because of that you can't get enough boats to a series to do that hmm. <clears throat> if here again the farley fontano soapbox if isaf or world sailing or someone just stood up and go for the next eight years we're going to use this rule abc yeah and from now on starting next year we're going to have world championships in five classes in this rule and this rule only yeah. And that's going to be the recognized rule. In three years from now, you'd see so many cool boats designed to that rule because they know there's some stability and there's a world championship every year. And there's going to be, and just like IOR, those boats will trickle down to the, to Mobile Yacht Club, Houston yeah. Yacht Club, yeah. Chicago Yacht Club, Bayview, you name it, New York. Yeah. Right. I mean, so 
I don't, I don't think it's what we do for the event. I think the event would come. It's how we rate the boats and the rules. Because right now, nobody wants to have the, the guts to stand up and go, here's the rule. Yeah. Like it or leave it, love it. And this is the only rule that we're going to recognize in the world. Yeah. That would be a hard decision. But if done, it would be so much better for the sport, I think. Yeah. Well, I know, uh, like, I, I was talking, good Lord, I was talking with somebody uh, two days ago, and they they were, to, oh, I think it might have been Nixon saying uh, he was doing, he was getting on some ORC purpose-built boat just for something in Newport, um, you know, one of the TP-52s. You know, and it's like, you know, the T- Transpac 52 design process, I was around and uh, sailing with Alan Andrews at the time, so I got to see, you know, all of that kind of get developed and, and was around the story as it was, you know, the, the rule was being developed. You know, it's basically an open box rule, boom, boom, boom. But then, of course, the boats that were just designed and built to go to, to the Transpac, they started trying to do Key West with such a cool boat, but they couldn't go up wind with the other boats, you know, and that just changed the whole rule up completely. And you look at the TP class now, it's, you know, now they're all upwind, downwind boats built for the Med, and that's Right. About it, and you know. the, 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 the class, the Super Series class, I mean, the PP-52 class and yeah. the Super Series event has directly, has definitely molded those designs. Right. But you're right. When that boat started, that boat was just going to be a, a fun machine, almost like the old 70s. You know, let's go yeah. downwind and yeah. go to Hawaii and have a blast. Um, it is, it's evolved. And I think the class is great. And if there's any one thing now, if there's any one class out there that actually begins to gravitate or trickle down back into the mainstream sailing, it's got to be the, T- the TP-52 class. Yeah. You know, there's some- I mean, they've done a great job. There's boats on the market. Now, this year for the first time, there'll be a Great Lakes 52. Mm-hmm. There's, got a, there's a couple other in Australia. There's a small little pod of them that they're racing. So it, it's it, – it, that – it's the closest thing we've had to something trickling down and and in keeping coming into the mainstream. Right, and I agree with you. It. It, it was the closest thing we had to one rule where everybody could kind of level the playing field. And like you say, that kind of gets me back to the point of having one big event, you know. And you know, I, I'm the weirdo that loves to, you know, throw the brain trust out and let's get started doing something. I don't know wherever to go with, you know, where to go when I come up with these ideas, but I'd love to see another SORC. You know, start in Houston, go around Florida, go up to Virginia, you know, lengthen the race because the boats are a little faster now. It's something like that, you know, where you have periodic stops and, you know, I, I think mean, that would be amazing those, to see. That, that would be a great, I mean, those events would be great. I mean, again, I'm going to, I'm going to go back until there's a rule that people feel like if I'm going to spend a million and a half dollars on a boat. Yeah. I want to know that it's at least competitive mm-hmm. and it will be for yeah. three seasons yeah. so that I can spend it and play with my friends and go out and have a great time and be competitive. My, I'm not, I don't want to win. I just want to be competitive, be in the hunt. Um, until we have something that people can sink their teeth in, I'm sure I'm going to get a million letters from ORR and IRR, IRC and ORC. Hey, we've got it. We've got it. I believe they've all got it. I just don't believe that anybody's ever said this is the rule we got to pick. Yeah, and that's that's to me what the flaw is. Yeah, and it'd be great if we can get Stormsail Tri oh, to step up and do something. You know, that's kind of what I always thought. That's what they did. They did the the backroom politics to handle that. But you know, I don't know. When you look back at the Kenwood Cup days when it was rolling, yeah, you know there were sixty, seventy boats. And, you know, the final race was a thousand miles around Hawaii, but we spent, again, six weeks in Hawaii. You know, I mean, how bad can that be, even if you're not on a great boat? But, you know, it was it was a it was a financial it was a logistics nightmare. Oh, yeah. Um, But, you know, SRC was a logistics nightmare, you know, end up in Nassau and and Admiral's Cup wasn't as much of a logistics nightmare other than we had to get the boats to England. All right, well, let's move off this little uh, topic. We've kind of run that one a little while. Uh, let's go to uh, your favorite boat. What is, what is your favorite boat? Now, I know you obviously race on everything. Do you have one particular favorite? I think, I think I, I, I'm not going to say my favorite boat. 
very similar to the TP-52s, when the international 50s, all, all still IOR, thank God, we all went from mastheads to fractionals, mm -hmm. and just about 90% of the fleet was fractional. And we would have between, you know, 15, 18, 20 boats at five to 10 events a year, whether, you know, whether it was Japan, whether it was United States, Key West, whatever, there's some big racing and we had a blast. Yep. And that to me was the funnest, big crews, very similar boats, good, hard, hard racing. Uh, right, and it's very similar to the 52s today. You know, I mean, yeah. the 50 probably was the predecessor to the 52, but the, you know, of course, you know, back in the 70s when we, we won the first, two of the first four, maybe J24 Worlds, when the, I mean, we won two, number two and number four of the second and the fourth Worlds, the class was blowing up. Yeah. Everybody was there. I mean, you go to regatta and every and anybody was there fighting it out. Those, those were great times too. Um, there's been so many cool boats and so many cool events. And then last but not least, the Winquist Rifle Pew 86 mm -hmm. could have been the prettiest boat I've ever walked on. Yeah. And it was in her heyday when it was Zephyrus, it was a machine. And when we got it, it was a machine. Yeah. Uh, 600 gallons per side of water ballast. That thing would go up wind at 14 knots and you're going, this is great, you yeah. know? So uh, there's been a lot. The best racing boat, the best racing could easily be the 52s now or for me, the 50s. Uh, when they turn to fractal rigs. I gotcha. All right, now, like you said, knowing that uh, you're one of the head guys at Quantum, and I, I don't even know what your official title is because it's way above my pay grade, but how have uh, you helped, or how has Quantum, you know, gotten everything together for the storm and keeping, the, you know, with, with the pandemic going? You know, how's, how's, how are we doing with that, uh, you know, the future proofing of that? Well, that's a good question. That's um this has been a very unique time for all businesses in the world. Yeah. I would love to say, hey, it was just us in America, but this is the world. And it's not just sale making business, it's business, mm -hmm. business in general. You can't, well, some businesses prosper, but 90% <laughs> of the businesses in the world were basically affected by that. And, and Quantum was no different. We're very fortunate because as big as we may seem, we're still a pretty small company that we're able to be flexible enough and so we we looked at the ideas and said you know we need to reach out to our people mm -hmm. we need to reach out to not our people but all people that are sailing and so we spent months those months of sitting at home where I, i'm telling you not many sales were sold mm -hmm. there was nobody out on the water you couldn't leave your house you know one of our biggest sailing centers in the world in italy is just crumbling at, at, the, at, the, at the bottom, at the bricks of it all. We just said that we're gonna contact people and we're gonna stay with them. And we're gonna just let them know that we're here and if there's anything you can do, we're gonna talk to you about it. We wanna talk about sale. And let me tell you, everybody you call during that time period wants to, wanted to talk about sailing. They needed to get away. Even though we weren't going up wind and without salt water on our face or fresh water, they wanted to talk about sailing. And that was a model that we kind of pushed and I think we're success, very successful with. It's gonna be an interesting exit out of this into sailing. I mean, sailing's gonna change as a lot of things in this world are gonna change after this. Yeah. Um, you know, I think that we, we're gonna be a little bit, we're gonna be a little while before we're gonna get, have a huge regatta where we have 400 people on the lawn of New York Yacht Club all bundled up, hugging and you know, we're a very social sport and racing is a lot of that, you know, that social, uh, the socialness of it all. I think right now we're seeing pods of little racing here. I, I, I think we're going to see one design, small middle America, one design, just as in, not just middle America, middle Italy, middle Greece, where, you know, people can get in their boats and go and race regionally and not have to spend the night or maybe they come back or whatever but they're where it's going to be easy and they can play because i think sailing is going to prosper in the year 2020 because people aren't going to go on vacation 
they're going to play with their votes. Yeah. And I'm sticking to that. I hope it works, but I'm just saying that's what, but that's kind of the, the direction, you know, we're, we supply sailing solutions and we have so many smart people that work at quantum and some great young talent and some great older, wiser men. <laughs> but I'm just saying that was the avenue that we decided to go at. Whether right or wrong, well, we won't know for a year or so, but that's what we decided to do. Yeah. Well, I know uh, just listening to the sales meetings and things like that, I, I know I'm just blown away and impressed by how far ahead the leadership of Quantum is. And y'all are seem to be ahead of everything. So. You know, good for you guys just well, keeping you. it going. I, uh, I, we'll see in a year from now. I just, you know what? We're just we're small enough to be able to be to mobile. You know, Ed Reynolds does a great job in the league. We got some great, some great people with good. They've got common sense. We got smart guys. We got so we kind of all combined, and it's it's a great. Uh, I'm so fortunate to be at the right place at the right time when we founded that thing years ago. Yeah, 1996, I think. Yeah, you, you know, just thinking about some leadership at Quantum, um, I was just sitting there thinking about uh, Andrew Scott, and I've got an interview with Alex Komet following this one, and uh, we we all got in a lot of trouble at Youth Champs one year, eons ago down at Gulfport, we had taken over a water slide, and uh, <laughs> we all, you know, the whole Youth Champs group went to this water slide, and of course, you know, you bring a hundred Was Andrew there? In. Andrew was there, wow. yeah. Yeah, we all got kicked out and thrown out of a wet willies in Gulfport, but uh, that was that was a good time. So a, another story for another interview, right? Yeah, exactly. I'll get Andrew on for that one. All right, so uh, let's go to regattas now. Try to keep it short, but I need one good regatta that's absolute best. You know, just the cherry on top, the best, the best regatta. You know, doesn't have to necessarily be results, but just something really good. I mean, for me personally, that you mean yeah. what about it? You look, it stands out in your life as the one. Yeah. Um, that nineteen for me, that nineteen eighty two J twenty four Worlds, yeah. eighty five boats or eighty six boats. I don't remember. Dave Curtis, like uh, Kostecki was just a kid. Billy Allen, but it was it was twelve days of racing and. We had a distance race. We had two distance races. <laughs> in a world. A distance race that yeah. uh, we were in 40 something and they abandoned it in San Francisco for no win. Wow. No win in the fall. <laughs> and this was no throwouts. And we had another distance race where we had to go out one mile rock, about a mile beyond the Golden Gate on the, uh, I think on the south side. Pea soup fog, boats were crashing. Um, there's a funny story. Hank Stewart, we raced that regatta real quick. We raced that regatta with Hank Stewart and Coleus, Robbie Young, um, who was Coleus' bow man on the, on the America's Cup boat, uh, Walter Glasgow, who they came back from the Olympics, Hank Stewart, who was a grinder, and myself. And we found, we knew we were going to do this race, and we found a, a, a placemat at a breakfast place two days before the race that had the whole bay. And Hank was a little bit of a geek, as we all know, and we love him because he's our geek. Mm -hmm. He kind of figured out what would be about five knots was what we were trying to go up win at that time and made a little made a, a grid. And we went in the fog in that grid. And now boats are crashing and Coley is his, his veins are sticking. He's about to ready. He goes, Hank, they, that mark, you know, he says, tack here. I think the mark is going to be right in front of us. That mark better be in front of us. He's just on and on. And all of a sudden, because it was so pea soup, it came up so fast we couldn't even get our spinnaker pole up. Yeah. And we rounded. We went in 30th and came out fourth. Wow. And so, but it was just great racing. Huge flood in the at the circle. Mm -hmm. Boats couldn't lay the weather marks. All some of the greatest sailors in the world are fighting down there and just can't lay. It was just great sailing and the, the great beach up the city front. San yeah. Francisco can't beat it for racing. Yeah. All right, now conversely, I'm going to ask you the same as I do everyone else. What's your worst, worst regatta, worst trip, worst something? Because, you, know, you know, you can't say they're all great. Everybody likes to no, go there, no. but no, there, there's always some bad ones. One year, we, um, we went down to Auckland. It's a funny story about that. We went down to Auckland to do a, a, a team race. 
uh, and it was called the Omega Cup. Omega Watch sponsored it, yeah. and it was the premier at that time regatta. And we went down there and we won that thing, and it was great. Myself, Coleus, uh, Kurt Edkin, maybe we had a couple guys from from uh, New Zealand. So we went the next year. We were the studs. <laughs> we didn't make it out of the first day and we were eliminated oh, all wow. the way to New Zealand. Oh. We couldn't buy a break. We couldn't beat any, we, we couldn't have gotten those boats down Niagara Falls. I mean, we just were terrible and oh. we were on the first plane home. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That hurts. Uh. It's, it's funny. You know I mean? Golfers, sailors, you know, some days you're on fire, some weeks you're on fire and the next week can't find the green. Oh yeah, and we couldn't find the green. Yeah, yeah, it definitely does happen. All right, so what is uh, your best role on a boat? You know, if you say you're on a big boat, what, what's your main well, job? I mean, on it? In the, for years, I was a mainsail trimmer. Probably not a great mainsail, definitely not a bad mainsail trimmer. But I trim main, and so part of that mainsail trim team, the mainsail the the mainsail trim team is a triangle of the mainsail trimmer, the tactician, and the driver. And so it's a communication skill of what does the driver want to do and what is the tactician telling us we need to do. Yeah. And that, and then the mainsail trimmer also has to kind of help the headsail trimmers because sometimes to get the boat to our target boat speed number. Yeah. So right now, as I've gotten older, it's pretty hard. Hey. When, when some guy calls me, he's got a great project. Man, I got the greatest 66-year-old mainsail trimmer. He's really cool. Uh -huh. and it just doesn't go over that well. But the, the thing no. that that mainsail trimming spot has done, which has evolved me into a much better coach, is the communication that it takes but for that three to keep a boat going at target boat speed longer than anybody else up a beat. Yeah. Because when you're sailing for 40s, you're sailing um, – any of these bigger one design boats that we race, those those old fifties, the guys who stayed at target boat speed the longest up the beat and could stay on that number mm -hmm. were always the first two or three guys at the weather mark. And that was the goal. It wasn't to be the fastest boat. It wasn't always to be the best tactics, although that helps. We're gonna stay at target boat speed and we're gonna work hard to stay right at that number. Yeah. And you know, when when I tell someone I want them to ease the main sheet a half an inch, they look at me like I'm crazy. I go, no, that's what it takes just to get that bump, to get yeah. the boat. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you're speaking of uh, nobody wants a 66-year-old main trimmer. I got a job for you in in, uh, in June or July. So. Call me. <laughs> All right. Uh, have you ever seen anything strange floating by? I mean, I'm sure you have, but what's the strangest thing you've seen? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I've seen it. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know if I could actually say that on this on on this, but uh, I'll try to. Good news is, all of us know sailboats can be so quiet, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and we had had we'd done an SRC race, and I think it was on Morningstar, where we had gone. We started Miami, went to the Bahamas, came back to Lauderdale, and now are sailing from Lauderdale to Miami, and it is eight, nine in the morning. You know, and in front of us, we're just sailing, and everybody's tired. You know, that morning, it's we probably have been up all night and are very little sleep, and you're sitting around, and there's a boat anchored, and just work hard on the wind, so it's not like we're chasing this boat down. He's just anchored. And there's nothing, it's kind of weird, just a little, kind of maybe a 25 or 30 foot power boat just anchored there. So as we're sailing by and we're dead quiet because we're just gonna kind of go by, there's a couple right in the middle of the action. <laughs> she jumps up, he's looking around. Now he's looking up at 10 or 12 guys looking down at him because we're <laughs> up on the rail. She doesn't know what to do. She's trying to cover herself. And I'm sure as fast as we passed them, as uh -huh. we got there, we're gone. Uh -huh. And she stand up and he is like, what just happened? <laughs> Where did y'all come from? <laughs> Where did you come from? And why here of all places? So, yeah, we've seen some strange stuff floating around out there. <laughs> That's a good one. 
All right. Um, now, on the water or even in coaching, do you coach people or, or do you sail this way, uh, aggressive or conservative? You know, do you coach one way or sail the other, or what do you think? You know, I, I, you learn, again, when I went back to tell you I sailed all those guys, there's nobody more aggressive than sailing with T. Hutch. Mm. Just all the time, all the time, all the time. I mean, it's and, and it's been very successful and it's a great way to be. I think in the flip side, I did probably six years with John Bertrand, who was quiet as a church mouse during the whole day. And then afterwards you blow up. But I mean, <laughs> whether you're in first place or last place, I think composure now is the key. You want to be aggressive where you got to be aggressive and you've got to be smart. Smart sailing wins more than aggressive, you know, aggressive adrenaline adrenaline affected sailing. I yeah. want to. I want to be. I want to be that aggressive guy on the starting line. I want to see that aggressiveness, and I want to be smart all the way around the course. I don't want to have to shoot the corner to win twenty boats. I want to get two here. I want to get one there. I want to get three here, and I want to finish in that four, five, three, two, four, five spot mm. every race, because in the end, that's going to be the guy that's going to win. Yeah. All right. So. Uh... Have you pulled off any one really great maneuver, you know, that you can think of and what would it be? You know, and, you know, you were talking about that uh, mark rounding in the fog. That sounds pretty good. But, you know, if you that come was, up with that something really like good. that, that, uh, you know, it was um, there. There, I mean, so many things that that you at the at, you know, you do it out there. I think the weirdest thing or not the weirdest thing that something. We had, you know, now almost everything is televised. Yeah. We do it during the day. You know, we had in the, in the I, can't, I hate to keep saying in the old days, but when we're out, when you're out in the middle at 4 a.m. in the Gulf Stream and everybody is harnessed in and we're going from the three to the four and it's an outside set and we're, you know, we're beating up a norther in the Gulf Stream and the waves are about 15, 20 <laughs> feet high. And... You know, we, we lose somebody overboard, but they're harnessed on, and now we got to keep the sail and try to get this guy back on the boat. I, I think there was so many great stuff that happened out in the ocean that you do that nobody ever sees. Mm -hmm. And we did it because that's what we did. And then later you go to think about it and go, you know, that, that double pole jive in 40 knots of breeze was pretty cool. You know, yeah. was that three nights ago or four nights? I don't remember what night that was, but four <laughs> nights ago, that was a cool jive, you know? Yeah. And so I think, I guess the, the coolest maneuvers were the ones that people never saw that we did in the middle of the night mm -hmm. because we really loved what we were doing. And we, we enjoyed that. We, it was nothing. We just enjoyed being out there. That's like we were doing our job. Yeah. Now, have you ever broken anything uh, massive? Like, I've been in several demastings. I've been in a couple just epic T-bones where, you know, we're lucky to make it in. Have you ever been involved in anything just over the top oh, like that? Come on, of course. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, holes and bugs. We broke the same mast twice when you're at Kenwood Cup on a 70. But <laughs> the, the best thing was we were doing, a, we were, I was racing. I did a lot of racing for Japan. <laughs> with a guy named Hiro Hashiba, who is the UK guy over there and is a great friend of mine. And his brother, who's also named Hiro Hashiba, bought a 50 footer and we were gonna go do a regatta and a brand new boat. And when we got it, when the delivery crew was delivering it from Tokyo down to where we were, they went and gets a heart and bent the keel. Mm. <laughs> so through a series of deals, we took that keel off and took it to a shop in downtown, not downtown Tokyo, but Tokyo's so big, there were buildings everywhere. It was a big machine shop. And they had this press and they were drop. we put the keel on its side. And they had this, uh, this huge metal, it was, it was a hammer. And they dropped that thing down on the keel and that keel would jump up. And we bound that keel down and then took it back on a truck. And that night they refared it. We put it back on, and we sailed the next month. Wow! <laughs> now that's that's a pretty good story. To see, to see a fifty footer keel jump at some points, it hit it and come up almost uh -huh. a meter high. Yeah. And I'm going, oh, <laughs> you're this like this is never going to stay. I ain't seen nothing yet. Uh huh. 
And all the Japanese guys were laughing. They thought it was so cool. And I went, holy shit. So it wasn't like we got in a wreck. I mean, I, after a while, we've seen so many holes and rigs fall down and, you know, yeah. uh, keels fall off. I mean, one time, Coley and I were racing on a Sovereign 30 and the keel slipped down that much. And we had to, we bailed the boat out through the last 30 miles of a race to go in. But that bouncing of that 50 footer keel sticks way out in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> that, that would. All right. Uh, now, I, I already have a good idea, but America's Cup, what are your thoughts? Now, I know Quantum's a big partner of uh, American Magic, and, uh, right. you know, but what are your I, thoughts I, on the foiling? I, I, right now, the America's Cup goes in so many different directions. And if you look at the history of the Cup, the history of the Cup has always been the biggest, the baddest, the strongest, the coolest, rich guy, or fastest boat. Mm. Fastest boat has always won the America's Cup. Right. You know? Uh, do I still wish we had a one design boat that was a monohull that we could have more countries involved? Those regattas in Australia and then in New Zealand and then where we've had, I mean, some great events. Uh, the the 75s where Kayard and, and, and uh, Mr. Gardini and all of those guys, yeah. that was great racing. And we've kind of stepped away. Right. Are we going to the fastest boats in the world? Yeah. Uh, but if only four people can play, and for a long time in the history of the Cup, there was only two people playing. Mm. But to have those 10 countries beat each other up and have three challengers from a country trying to also, I mean, three defenders trying to beat the defender and then the, the challengers, God, I love those days. And I think it would have great spectator appeal. Catamarans are great to watch, but so, to answer that question, I wish we would go back to a monohull boat that was stupidly fast, but great to match race with, mm -hmm. and that it would be affordable so that five countries from Europe could play, and New Zealand and Australia, and you know, and we'd have great, great races, and it brings out great, great sailors. Yeah, I mean, I, I think the boats we have now are just, they're over the top, you know, but they're amazing looking machines, but it is such an engineer's race, and you know, and the talent, of course, that we everybody's put together is obviously just incredible. But I feel like, okay, we're kind of wasting. We've we've got so much talent that, you know, they're just sitting there grinding. You know, and the technology is just. I'm sure it can't it's, be easy to sail. It's, but it's, Ill, it's an ill rule. It's a rule ill written. Yeah. Because somebody, just one person, can make can almost make the rules if you win, and. Because America for so long had won with some great rules. I mean, and they did and they did bring in the twelve meters, which ends up to be their demise in eighty three or what was that? Um, that is you know, we'll always I, I I hope somebody at some point goes, Stop the madness. Yeah. And let us let's get, get back to some great, great racing and something that also trickles down the one nice thing when we were young, America's Cup, everything that they learned would trickle down to the guys over at Port Arthur Yacht Club in Port Arthur, Texas. Right. And right now, I don't know what it's going to trickle down. I mean, we are, at least they're soft sailed, which is nice. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, there's going to be some stuff that trickles down, but nothing like the old days. Yeah. All right. I got a cat attacking oh, me. Um, um, yeah. Well, I'm, I agree with you on just about all those things. Um, all right, let's move on to the next one. What kind of plans do you have on sailing? Are you going to keep playing with your J-22 uh, and doing local stuff, or do you have a, a big boat you got to go take care of? Or? I had a huge I had a huge schedule this summer. <laughs> you know, I had a year before last, I was, I was gone almost, I don't know, seven months, seven and a half months around the world coaching, and we had some great sail projects, and that was fun. I was tired. And, and the following year, last year, I really tried to throttle back. Um, and then this year, I had some more, a lot of coaching stuff. I was supposed to coach the TP52 for the DeVosses and the Great Lakes, which I'm hoping we still do. Um, and I have concentrated here on my J22 because 
it's the biggest class that we have in our area. And I just want to sell something one design. I didn't really care what boat it was. Yeah. I don't I don't have any I don't have any goals of being the world's greatest J twenty two sailor. I just want to race. Mm -hmm. um, it I think it's gonna be very interesting the rest of the year to see how this evolves. You know, um I was coaching Dan Terrace on the Extreme Two and you know that little group uh those marching 32s have her kind of kind of throttled back a little bit they're going to try to do some practicing um i think it's going to be a very loaded last half last five five four months of the year and hopefully we start life again as we saw it in yeah. january if like if we ever do see life as it was i got gotcha. you all right so this is going to be a long video so we're going to have to shorten your answers a little bit quick quick questions uh, what do you think of the state of women sailing? Of women sailing? Women sailing. Yep. It's growing at a rapid rate. Yeah. Uh, I agree. And, and I'm all for it. Yeah. I'm all for it. I think Quantum has sponsored the College Sailor of the Year, Women's College Sailor of the Year from the get-go. We are all for it. You know, there's a, a lot of great women sailors, and uh, there's plenty of room on that. There's plenty of room in that bay for all sailors. Yeah. Uh, what can we do to make it better for them, you know, for women? Do you think just putting more of them driving bigger boats or or is this something they need to it, do on their own? Or what are you, what are as your much thoughts? as I hate to say it, it's still, it's still a good old boys club. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and there's some great sailors that are going to be out there and they're going to be strong enough and they're, they're going to be able, they'll be able to drive boats. And uh, they're going to have to do it the same way we all did it and earn it. You mm -hmm. know, I mean out there race beat a couple of guys get on a boat get on a crew i don't think they want us to give it to them i think they want to they want to earn it and but we got to give them the opportunity to earn it we just need to have more women's events that then those women come up and race against you know the, all of those women that win the, the role they could get in any j70 event or all those women that do the women's match racing probably could actually do men's match racing yeah i mean those are the events that they're going to have to strive for yeah you know yeah. i don't think you know uh, i can't say i never say never but i mean the grinding requirements of the boats at america's cup right now are grueling yeah. they don't stop and i don't i just don't know i mean there's plenty of women that are going to be able to do that we just need to get them out and go settle yeah Okay. Uh, what advice do you have for new sailors, people new coming in the sport? What do you have for them? The one thing that we see a lot of, and that is not enough, they go out, they've read two books, they've got to know everything. Mm -hmm. the one, like someone taught me, he told me once when I started snow skiing, get a lesson, get 10 lessons. When you go sailing, get a lesson, learn your boat you know learn how to sail learn so that when you're blowing 20 you're comfortable mm -hmm. so get a lesson get get 10 lessons yeah. learn how to sail yeah it's better than just going out there blind and beating your head in all right um, but they they read a book they yeah. have to know what's going on they read the book you know well now it's youtube uh you know there's so many people watching youtube videos and thinking they can uh thought, go uh, live on a boat i think i made it look easy right <laughs> yeah um all right. Uh, any ideas on how we can grow the sport? And just get new people in the sport, period. Uh, I mean, the sport has a long time was, was viewed as a rich man's sport. And yet, you and I are prime examples why it's not. Yeah. You know? Um, I, I think to get more people in, I think, I think U.S. Sailing, World Sailing has done a terrible job marketing our sport. Uh, I think when you look at this go-go RVing, RVing commercials that you see on television, mm -hmm. you know, guys in their motorhomes or Winnebago's, sailing should do stuff like that because sailing for a while was a great America was a great pastime for families mm -hmm. to come out destination, and I think we're going to see a lot of that this this uh, this summer, but. I think that we don't promote ourselves, so we get exactly out of it what we put into it. We being the industry or the sport, yep. you know, especially the sport. No. Yep. 
Well, hopefully we can get something done with that. Um, all right. Well, that's going to wrap it up here. Do you have anything else to add? Anything no, to throw out there? Out, which is very unusual for me. Uh huh. You know. <laughs> no, I was saying thanks for thanks for having me. I I, I think this is a, a great format, and it, it I know everyone I listen to is so different. It's so nice to hear everybody's different approaches yeah. of what they did and how they got here. And, and you know, there's a million there's a million ways to get to the weather mark. There's a million ways that people have got into sailing and how it's worked for them. Uh, I've just been very fortunate that it's worked so well for me. I often pinch myself to think that I'm still here and where we are, especially with quantum. So thanks again. Great job. Oh, well, thank you. I'm just happy to do it. And like I say, this is a good way for me to reach out and connect with people and uh, hopefully other people connect with you. And, you know, because I know you've been around for a long time and so are most of the people that uh, I've interviewed. And, you know, everybody loses touch some way, you know, somehow. So right. hopefully uh, through these little videos, everybody gets to reconnect and just catch up. So that's oh, kind of kind of what I'm going for. Well, so. If anything, my mother will like this. How's that? Yeah. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, everybody, right. This, this is Zane with Sailing Views. I want to thank Farley for this. Uh, if you need anything, he is Quantum Gulf Coast. He's uh, out of Kima, Texas. So look him up if you need a sale, or you can look at me. I'll gladly help you with sales. So. Uh, <laughs> Father would be happy if I could get you a set of sales. I would. So. I'd love that. <laughs> All right. Well, once again, everybody, hit the like button, hit subscribe. Uh, we need to grow this channel, get more people on here. So with that, I'm going to bid you adieu. Over and out, and bye-bye.